Welcome back to Final Resonance TV and episode 10 of Musical Journeys. Today, my guest is my new buddy, Philip Schaus. Yes. <laughs> Here with us from Nashville, Tennessee this weekend, hanging out. And uh, if you don't know Philip, Philip has played with David Lee Murphy, Rodney Atkins, uh, Chris Cagle, Bo Bice, who just lives right with you, right? Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, Morning Wood, Morning my Wood. favorite band. Yeah. Uh, next to this other one, the Gene Simmons solo band, yeah. which is freaking awesome. And you have the Rock and Roll Residency, yes. which is a, a killer jam that I've attended myself a couple times now. So y'all need to go up to the Mercy Lounge on Tuesday nights. Yep. What time is it? Sorry. Uh, Eight-ish. Eight-ish. Eight-ish to eleven-ish. And they play some really kick-ass covers and rock and roll stuff with great legendary guests sometimes. We have, we've been very, uh, well, not lucky, but we, we know a lot of friends and people that are in town recording. We've had uh, Roger Glover uh, and Don Aaron from Deep Purple. Alice Cooper played. Um... Sylvain from New York Dolls, Rachel Boland comes in all the time, Derek St. Holmes. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had, I know I'm forgetting some people in that, 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 that lady up there on the wall. <laughs> Lizzie and Joe, I'm still there right there. That's right, Lizzie and Joe. You guys are up there, Lizzie and Joe. Uh, yeah, Lizzie and Joe, they come a lot. They're, they're, when they're not even playing with us, when they're in town, they're there. They're hanging out. They're big supporters. And, yeah. Because we've been, been very, uh, very blessed. Oh, Robin Zander from Cheap Trick. Right. 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 I heard about that. That's awesome. Yeah. Which I'll play. Well, the first he came twice. The yeah. first time he showed up, we didn't know he was coming both times. So it was like Robin Zander's here. Okay, hey man, what do you want to sing? We know tons of cheap trick. I don't want to do any of that stuff. <laughs> okay, <laughs> what do you want to do? Because I want to do ECDC. What do you know? We know the whole catalog. What do you want to play? It was long way to the top. You got it. <laughs> so we did long way to the top, and then we forced him into doing he's a whore and um, hot love. Wow. And then the next time he came, he wasn't going to sing at all. He had his kid play. His son Robin playing guitar, right. and then he sang "Dead Flowers" with us. And then we did two more cheap trick songs. Wow. But we forced him into it. Did you do both any, times? Did you do any of that? Like, did you do "Surrender" or something? Oh no, 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 no! no we didn't, 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 like, you didn't do it. You did more of no. Fun. We're doing a tax man or thief <laughs> or something like that. We're <laughs> more obscure stuff. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you do that? <laughs> so anyway, uh, let's talk a little bit about the Gene Simmons solo project. Just get yeah. into just a little bit about. When that started, how long ago now? This is the first year. So our first gig was either in February or March. Yeah, yeah. And Ryan, I, I heard, was the the person who ended up making that happen for you. Yeah, yeah. Ryan Ryan Cook, uh, who's the who's the brunette guitar player. If you've seen any videos, uh, right. two blondes and a brunette. That's him. <laughs> and he knew Gene. He was in a band called Hair of the Dog right. in the late 90s. And so I think they did Open for Kiss on maybe some of the late reunion or early farewell shows. Okay. And so we got to know Gene then, but then after that, uh, Ryan became, kind of got in the McGee camp. Okay. Doc and Scott McGee management, right. who's Kiss's management. Right, right. So, got in with them, and Ryan's in a band called Big Rock Show, with Jeremy Asbrock, the other ball guitar player in Gene Simmons' band, right, right. and the Residency. Right. Uh, they're in that band. They've played every Kiss cruise. So on the last Kiss cruise, Gene pulled Ryan aside and said, you know, I've got a handful of shows. It was only a handful at the time. It was like five. Right. I've got this handful of solo shows next year. Can you put a band together for me? He knew Ryan was in Nashville and knew hired gun guys. And right, that right. was a rock and roll looking guy. I wonder if he could get a kind of rock looking band. Yeah. And so Ryan's like, yeah, I got the guys now. Right. So that was it. Wow. And then you guys were plugged right in. I got a phone call when I got <laughs> the boat and said, we're doing these. And, and oh, I've been doing it. I've had, and, you know, nothing ever that cool has come up. But you get stuff and it never happens. So I'm like, when we're on the plane to the gig, I'll, I'll believe, believe that. It. Right. I'll, when we're rehearsing, I'll believe it. So it's and everything's, everything and more has happened. That's crazy. Man. So so let's kind of go back. I'm going to go back to your beginning. So like when you started. Yeah. And we'll come back to that. Um, but when you started out, you were how old when you, like, just like your first memories of music and what? That's like three. Right. Three years old. Three. Yeah. My older brother, uh, uh, I have one brother, and he's 13 years older than me, Kevin. Right. Uh, so I was born in 75. So when I was, you know, toddler age, he it was, was the he, late seventies, and he was in high school. Right, right. right. Killer record collection. Right. So my first memories are just looking, are isn't really hearing anything, mm -hmm. but like thumbing through, and it was Aerosmith was first. They were A, right? right so they were right, the first. Right. Yeah, so <laughs> Aerosmith and going through Dan Zeppelin. I remember seeing the album covers, but then I guess the first music I remember hearing was Aerosmith too. I just okay. kind of loved. Whatever it was, they were just so, it was so attractive, like looking at the, 
looking at the gate folds and the oh, photos right. and the inserts and stuff. It was just like looking at the pictures of the guys. I didn't know what cool was. Right. I just knew it was like this is really attractive to me, and I don't I don't understand it, but it just is. So three and you're three, three and four, you're just like. Right, you just you don't know why you, you just, go for, go for certain things, but I went for that. Right. So as you went, uh, what was the next stage? Like the next step from being interested in music, your brother. What? When did you get a guitar? I was playing drums then because my brother was a drummer in high school. Playing, okay. we grew, I was in Wisconsin. Right. He played in the polka band. Right. So, and they rehearsed at our house, the drummer house. So right. it was always there. So I was playing drums, and then I wanted to play drums in. Like school band in fifth grade when they, I moved to Nebraska. Then. Okay. And you're from? From Wisconsin. Okay. And then I uh, moved to Nebraska in 80. And then so I couldn't play drums. You had to have two years of piano to play drums in, in Nebraska. Right, right. Hopefully, you got rid of that rule by now. I think you have. Um, but I picked saxophone because I love the Blues Brothers so much. Yeah, and totally. Blue, Blue Lou Marini was the most badass looking guy I'd ever seen. You know, the long brown hair and the provincial mustache, tenor sax player. And I said, well, I'll play sax. So it was like a decision like that. Right. So I played sax all through uh, high school where I met Michelle and right, right. uh, clarinet. <laughs> and um, both fellow woodwinds. And so I did that all through college and you know, whatever. Right. And then got a guitar like probably two or three months before we moved to Alabama in 88. So yeah. I was 12 when I got my first guitar. Right, right. That's kind of where it hit me 12, 13, 14. Yeah. But I've been playing music and listening to music since I was like since you were little. three and, yeah. and playing, you know, doing already ear training because. Saxophone did help me, but it helped my ear. Sure. I knew some theory, so sure. I already understood. So I started, didn't start guitar as like my first instrument. If they explaining music to me, I'd already had it explained. You were like the uh, Eddie Van Halen. Piano, right. yeah, right. yeah, piano, and drums, and guitar. Right, right. right. All, all the yeah. right? Yeah. You yeah. ended up like your instrument eventually, yeah. which is guitar. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. So, so your influences, yeah, this is kind of crazy because I heard some stories already about the, the Beatles, which kind of blew me away, and the Monkees. I became, okay, first, so in 86, it was the Beatles, the Monkees' uh, 20th anniversary of the TV show. Okay. So they were everywhere. They were on TV. They had an album, and I just was absolutely fascinated. I would watch the show. Right. I don't know if you ever did this, yeah. but... I would re audio record the show. Okay. So before we had a VCR or, or anything else, I would record <laughs> the uh, this, hold of the speaker and record it and listen to those so over nice. and over. Just the whole show, the skits and everything. Oh, okay. And I just loved the Marx Brothers esque thing. I didn't realize it was a Hard Day's Night copy because I hadn't seen right, it yet. Right, right, right. Down to the Beatles from that. So the monkeys kind of turned me on to sixties music. Right. Because. And then the Beatles, and this is in the the, the whole uh, hair metal. Uh, time I couldn't have given less of a shit about what was going on with right. Motley Crue and White Snake at the right. time. Because you were just I was a Beatles fanatic at right. like right. 10, 12 years old. Wow. Just couldn't get enough of it. Have you ever seen Across the Universe? No, I haven't. Oh, dude. I haven't. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I haven't seen that. You're a Beatles fan. That's, yeah. that's a killer movie. But anyway, yeah, that's cool that you went You went sort of to the 60s music before you went into any 80s music. Oh, right? man. Didn't even. And that kind of. It came way later because really? even in college, I didn't, I didn't really dig it. I didn't really dig it when it was happening. Right. Because then in high school, that was like middle school, elementary school. In high school, it was um, Sabbath, Zeppelin, Van Halen, Aerosmith, right. Right. Robin Trower was a big one for me in high school. Uh, yeah. And then I liked some thrash. Yeah. Like right. Metallica and Slayer and all that. I liked that a lot. Right. Um, but didn't care. And Kiss, of course. Yeah, yeah kiss right. hit me in tenth grade, and boy, that was huge. Yeah, um, but yeah, I really didn't. And people think like I'm a, this big '80s player. I think the residency is like this big '80s hair metal thing. <laughs> it's like it's it's like. No, have you been to a fucking show? We play go to a show and see. We play Montrose and and Ten Years and Songs. You know? <laughs> one night I was, one night I was there. You played Black Sabbath, which which I have rarely seen a band do. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, cool. do. I was like, yeah, yeah. It's like it's like I've not. I've, I've, I've got friends. I've got friends now that we're all in those bands. I love them now, but it's like we don't do that stuff. Right, you know? right. That's crazy. You know? <laughs> so, so the so when did the eighties catch on? Like Van Halen. When did you? What happened with Van Halen? And specifically that. Got you into Van Halen. I was 13, uh, and my brother bought me, for, bought me a CD player, my first CD player, like five CDs. Yeah. Um, Zeppelin II, uh, shit. Um, Zeppelin II, Revolver, um, Toys in the Attic, Zenyatta Mandata, and Van Halen 1. 
Right. I've had those all on record, but he rebought them for me on CD. So, and I, at the time, I thought Van Halen played keyboards. Sure. I'd only heard jump. Right. I did not know that he right. Right. did anything else besides that. So he put on uh, Van Halen 1 on the CD, and he skipped the track 2. And I just, I remember... Man, uh, I go here choked out. <laughs> yeah, I remember man. just fucking, I just, my just jaw dropping, oh, not knowing yeah. what it was like. I didn't understand what yeah, it even was. Yeah. And it's like, do you remember when your life took a, a certain turn? Oh, yeah. That was it. Yeah, man. And then that's over. And then, and talking about love starts, and it's just like, this amp is as big as the Empire State Building. And then Dude. I'm the one was the next one. It's like, <laughs> this is the best thing I've ever heard in my I life. Know, man. It was, so it was 80, that was 88. Yeah, so I, yeah, man, it's a it's a monumental album. Man. It was just huge, but it was funny because Sammy was already in the band. I had no idea how all the previous. Yeah, all I'd heard was Jump, and I didn't know anything else about Van Halen. Yeah, nothing else about Van Halen. Wow, yeah, that's crazy. You know what? It, for me, it was I had heard about him through Beat It. Oh, I heard. Yeah, I heard that. About was so him. big, but you know, you didn't see these people on. To you, I mean, unless you watch for sometimes on TV, you'd see it, but you didn't see them. And Van Halen had that one. Well, the well, they the oh, the Oakland show yeah, had yeah. those three videos yeah. where they would play MTV. But I had yeah. MTV. I got it late. I got so, it like and when I was in, I got it in eighty eight or eighty nine. Yeah, I had no clue. And so it was after that that I started seeing those videos. these Van Halen videos right. and like going back and oh checking out God. the rest of it. Right? Yeah. Well, I got to get fair warning now. So, yeah. <laughs> you know what? You know what? For me, that, that that you were talking about MTV. Right prior to MTV, there was Don Kirshner's rock concert. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. And Wolf and uh, Midnight Special. Yeah. And so yeah. so those two shows were kind of the first thing that got me going with that. You Lots can see music, Kiss. You can yeah, see them. You can finally see them. Oh my God! Yeah, I'll tell them. And, and so was, that was like, I think for our generation, you know, like for the people that were influenced by the Beatles when they were on TV. Yeah. It, this is sort of like our oh my God. exposure to, so the, huge. to the people on TV. Then if you didn't have MTV, remember Night Flight? Yeah. Remember Night Flight? Yeah. Yeah. Night Flight had yeah. videos um, right. late at night so you could see them there. So right. We watched them all night. Away. Yeah. <laughs> Just like we used to with the when they we would record cassettes off the radio. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like record all these yeah. songs, right? Like, and they'd play record, all record pause. Yeah. yeah. I remember one time they did the Van Halen block, like an hour or two of Van Halen, and I recorded the whole thing on yeah. tape, and then I yeah. had that tape, and that's how I that's how I get more exposed to the band. Yes. Yeah. That's amazing. So so you're in Van, you're you got your Van Halen thing going now, and then what else did you get into around the same time? Um, I mean, obviously you're into a kiss. That was yeah, that was Kiss came in around that time. That was a huge one too. Um because I was in I took uh, guitar lessons from Jeff Beasley at yeah. GTA GT's music. Yeah. And you know, yeah. Learning the shapes, everything, and just going right. This does not sound anything like Van Halen. What right, am I doing right, wrong? Right. Then I heard Kiss. I heard Alive. Right. And, and I was just that's what I'm learning. So you were. It sounded like what I was playing. You're doing pentatonic stuff. Yeah, the, the blues blues scales, blues scales, and, yeah, blues right. scales. Blues scales. And you know, now I can connect it to Eddie, but then you can't. Like this is anything like him. What's he doing? Right. But then Ace, it was. It was just. This is what he's playing. Yeah, I used to love when I heard Ace play this this whole single note. Yeah, and the vibrato. I, I can play it. And it would feedback. So then I could learn. Yeah, I started learning solo. So it was hard. Guitar came real. Didn't come immediately for sure. me. It was kind of tough. Yeah. And um, it, when you when I made that connection of, of wow, I can actually learn solos. I learned the whole record and probably could still almost play it. Which one? Alive. Yeah. 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 yeah and Alive was, was a big album. That taught me how to play. What was your favorite song? Alive. Oh man, I don't know. Uh, probably at the time it was Deuce. It was just so really? badass. The solo was great, but now I like, got to choose. Yeah, I love that song. Um, well, watching you and she are both on there too. So yeah, I'm watching you. Is that Black Diamond? I love Black Diamond. <laughs> I love Black Diamond too. Black Diamond. We play watching you. Watching you. She medley with Gene. Oh yeah, that just kills. Wow. So we play those two tied in together, which is always it's like when that, when that gets into separate lists. Yeah, yeah it's killer, man. Right? So so you keep going through that, and you got. Uh, in this period, obviously, you, you're going to have some bands, I assume, besides school band. Yeah. Yeah. So, my, my first one was a cult was called Excalibur. Okay. And that was with, I went to Austin High School, and so it was with uh, Kerry Gray, Chris Derrick, and Chris Culver from Austin High School. Okay. So we formed and played, I think had like one or two original songs. And so this is like ninth grade? Or? This is, I think I was, I think I could drive, so I must have been a junior. Okay. It was 11th grade. Yeah. 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 11th grade. Yeah. And so our highlight was we played on, at the, we played at the Princess. Oh, really? And we played, um, yeah. but it wasn't a show, it was for this uh, WAFF, like, talent search. <laughs> 
Okay. And we got cool. beat by who beat us? I don't even think we placed. Really? I don't think so. No, I forgot who beat <laughs> us. This one girl danced uh, to Hank Williams Jr. Uh, Born to Boogie. She may have won that day. <laughs> wow. That's crazy. Yeah, so so that that was your first band. That was that was the first band. And then I met John Stallions, uh Jamie Presnell, and Jeff Sharp who went to Decatur High. Okay. And then we formed the first version of Subterrific Chuggalug. <laughs> and that was the four piece and it turned into a 13, 15 piece funk band that we did we could have did an album and everything, but this really? was just covers. Okay. okay. Well we had a, maybe original or two. Uh, but we did a lot of pe- chili peppers and um primus and funk stuff that I really hadn't but my my, my exposure to funk was extreme. Before, before right. this, right. I love extreme. Um, right. that, was, right. that was all I had. So <laughs> we were actually like, I kind of went back and then we started listening. I started listening to old cool, oh, like seventies cool in the gang, and right. of course James Brown and 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 things like that. Uh-huh. I started getting into like Parliament and learning seventh chords and minor seventh chords right. and learning different chord shapes. Right. And then Warren Truett came in, and that was kind of the Whitey Herzog's some terrific chuggalog thing we're kind of the same band kind of that did different music okay. but that was a big that was my first band that really did a lot of performing right because we went to Auburn right also we moved down there okay and played Auburn and you're playing bars and things like that so you learn how to kind of do it or you kind of get an idea of how to do yeah, it yeah you start doing all these gigs and getting getting better at yeah. it yeah yeah that, and that's in the college town what played the place yeah the exactly gigs. exactly and, and lots of receptive audiences <laughs> yeah that, yes. they're having a really good time the audience is more really drunker than the audience <laughs> right. that's true I remember those days <laughs> so you go from that to what uh, it was Auburn and then um, what happens then I, I went to uh, actually started move, I moved back to Decatur and sort of playing with this, with Jeff and Jamie again in a band called Girlfriend Voice, Billy Fortenberry on bass. Um, so another four piece band and pop stuff, original pop stuff, a couple covers, but mainly original stuff. Okay. Because you could, I don't know, it was late nineties, early two thousands. You could still kind of get some gigs yeah. as an original band. Yeah, right. Um, right. I haven't done that in a long time. Uh, but so we were, we started coming to Nashville and we played the Exit Inn. And that right. was my first time playing in Nashville. And I, I right. met uh, some people that I still know today and still play with today, okay. actually. At the Exit Inn, good. Mm-hmm. At the Exit Inn. So Jonathan Bright and Stateside uh, became, in, I ended up being in both of those bands. Okay. And Stateside uh, moved to Birmingham. I moved there with them. Was in that for a little bit, moved back home. That's when I moved to Nashville. Well, I started coming to Nashville, like in 2003, 2000. Yeah, 2002, I started coming up here right. and living in Decatur. So it was a really easy move back there, move back and forth, like just driving back and forth, easy commute. Right, right. So so you do that for a while. I guess you're going to meet a lot of people. Like you said, you went to Exit and you met some people. Yeah. And then you, uh, what, I mean, do you, these, these gigs that you got with Rodney Atkins and these Sideman gigs, yeah. How do you make the transition? What happens? I mean, is it just contacts or? That just fell in my lap. Somebody and called you up and said, hey, man. Pretty much. Uh, I was in a band called The Taste. It was like a sleazy rock and roll band. And we played on, uh, for this music festival that isn't, that doesn't happen anymore. Okay. We played on the pedestrian bridge um, in Nashville at like Sunday afternoon at 1 p.m. It was a great slide. Right, right, right. But we played there and David Lee Murphy's manager, Doug Casmus, happened to be there watching and noticed me and thought that. David Lee could use it like a rock and roll gunslinger type guy. Oh, okay. And so he knew uh, a guy that my friend Jack Purcell, I forgot what where he worked, but he was he's in he works at Big Machine now. Okay. I forgot what he did then, but he knew the girl I was seeing and said, Hey Doug wants to get Philip to audition for David Lee Murphy. So I was I was dying for work. But I didn't really know anything about the sideman world, so it was like going after it. It literally fell on my lap and I was right, open, right. open-minded enough to go, Yeah, I'll go do it. Sure. Sure. Yeah, that's what Damon was saying last week when he was uh, with me that most of the things that he came across sort of fell in his lap. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have ever like thought to do that. Because I just I'm just not because I um was not opposed to it, obviously, but just I just didn't know. I didn't know Anything you need to know that maybe. my phrase yeah. is I didn't know shit about dick when I moved to Nashville. <laughs> right. I really had no clue. Right. I right. never knew anybody that had a real music career. And then my um, girlfriend's mom, who was who was my 
not my wife and ex-wife, uh, but she was in Skinner. She still is in Skinner, one of the backup singers. Okay. So getting yeah. to know Carol Chase, getting to know her yeah. and see what she did and what they did and what people actually did that had a career in music was huge for me. Right. Get Total exposed. eye-opening. Right, you know? right, right. Which I had no is, idea. Which is one of the aims of uh, things that I want to I want to expose younger people to is yeah. is that well, how it happens for you that you you you're this kid in the cater and the next thing you know you're playing with cheap trick and Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's what yes, right. Day. right. That's the, yeah. It's just mind blowing. But but it, like you said, some of the stuff is just built on doing, doing, doing. Right. Just yeah. And I, I couldn't have. I couldn't even ask that guy to come see my show. I didn't know what I mean. He just happened to be there. So it's like one of those things like exactly. you don't you don't know who's watching. Right. Um, At any and point. it definitely wasn't a, even remotely near a country gig. Right. I mean, we right. were like kind of sleazy Guns and Roses type. Rock and roll. So then you went to Rodney Atkins, or had, what was the? Uh, Those years in between. Uh, David Lee was first, and then um, got the Morningwood gig, and that was all 2006, pretty and, much. And how did that come about? Um, Jeremy was teching for okay. them on the road, and okay. then he filled in. He started playing guitar, but a band that he was in was going to make a record or something. I, or something. I don't know. He couldn't. He, I think that's what happened. He had to record. Right. So he called me and said, why don't you come in and do this gig? And we were about to, like, we were about to do Letterman, Leno, all the European festivals, Japan. It's like it was all the year was kind of laid out. I'm like, yeah, wow. I'm going to do this. So wow, what? So when you before that, I mean, you've done the David Lee Murphy thing. That was pretty much. Uh, that was a couple weekends a month. Okay. So it wasn't really heavy any heavy touring because he was already really successful as a songwriter. So he was like, yeah. Right, right, right. So this is my first big touring, touring, yeah, touring and thing. then you get freaking the big shows. I mean, yeah, I mean that put me on. We did all the European festivals, we did all the TV shows. So then I started getting endorsements for right. that stuff. Right. So it just kind of all picked up, and then I was really dry for a while. I had put Chris Cagle in there, but really work at taking every gig I was offered. Right. Like right, you know, that's right. one thing. It just shows you. I mean, I just got off this tour where I did all these things and come home and I don't have any work. Right. right. So I that was like. So, oh. but you know what I think? <laughs> I think I, you know one of the key the messages in what you're saying is that you know I don't know if you ever saw a Yes Man. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> right. for sure. You say yes to everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And I kind of, in my mind, that's kind of my my philosophy. Is you know, that, you know, you 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 know something. And I still I say yes to as much as I can. Yeah, right. That, that, sure. Something that makes sense. Sure. I will sure. absolutely do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, go do it. Yeah, and 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 because you have, that's what, half the reason you've been able to be yeah. seen by somebody to get you in a sideman position. Yeah, because I mean, with even that with Gene, we don't tour. We don't play. Every weekend, we don't play all the time because right, right. he's so busy. Right, right. So in those slow months yeah. that I have, all the people that I toured with, all the people that I met during those ten years of country side man work, mm -hmm. that's what saves me in the slow months. Because all of a sudden, calls come in. It's like, can you come to this demo session? Right. Can you do this showcase? Can you do this quick weekend run? So right. that's what really helps me out still. Right. Is all that labor back in the that. day. Yeah. So so rock and roll residency. Yep. Um, let's talk about how that came together. How long ago was that? In 2014, okay. it started, and Jeremy came over, and we've been friends for, and we've done so many things. We had so many tribute acts that we did, uh, Lizzie, Aerosmith, Iron Maiden, we do whatever, all these things. Right. It's like, we should do a residency for a month, because we know all these tunes, we know all these people that can come, John Karabi, Kip Winger, Mark Slaughter, all these guys that can that we know that can come. Right. Damon, play the first one. Damon Joss, play the first one. Really? So, um, wow. so we... We booked a month, and it was me, Jeremy, Chuck Garrick, from yeah, Austin, yeah, no, and David Parks. Yeah. And so we played for a month. It went great. Huge crowd at the end. All right. Why don't we just play through the summer? Great. So we kept on playing the three months. So it was April to, I guess, end of August, September. Mm -hmm. People kept playing. People kept saying, I mean, coming to the shows. So then it was, let's just keep going. So we're on our fourth year now. Awesome. And venue change. We were at Dan McGinnis. Yeah. I was Music Row, and then we moved to Mercy this this year. Yeah, yeah. And Mercy's been, you know, I've been going there for years to see other shows. We love it. It's, it's, room, it's, yeah. it's, it's always great. Yeah, and then there to see lots of people over the yeah. years. Yeah, and it's, it's a great venue. And, you know, when I was there, you know, the first time I came, you know, I was like, wow. This is the rock scene in Nashville. Yeah, it's really blown <laughs> I was up. like a rock scene. Awesome. It's, it's really blown up. We were doing, like I said before that, we had done different tribute shows and some right. things. Um, some we should kind of got our, our foot in that thing. Right. And then this is it. All kind of led up to this. Right. And now we kind of don't do those anymore, just because this takes up 
on right. time, and it fills it fills the need too. Right, yeah. we do the same kind of songs. It's just cool to see that that many people, you know, around the rock thing in Nashville. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if this is the case because you know you know better, but from the outside looking in, it seems like over the last decade. People from the West Coast have moved to Nashville. I mean, you know, Kip Winger, people like this, yeah. Tom Kiefer, all those folks that have come in from the West Coast, you know, for obvious, you know, cost reasons, it's cost of living is lower. They've, they've, they've been in town for a long time. For a right? long right. time. Right. Well, I moved in 04. They've been there longer than I have. So we have everything's kind of caught up to them. Yeah, so the resurgence, I mean, not resurgence, but this kind of swell of rock stuff, rock, yeah. uh, rock scene, you know, I think it's, I, this is, Tell me, is it because all these guys that come in and and they're more of a base of that? There, yeah. The before. There's producers, there's, engineers like there's Michael Wagner. Michael Wagner, 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 Wolf Hoffman from Hoffman, Accept has yeah. been there since the nineties. Yeah, he yeah. moved decades ago, and then Wagner followed suit. Right. Close, and then all the guys in Cinderella used to live there. Uh, Fred Curry's the only guy who doesn't now. They're right. all there. Wow. Okay. But they've been there forever, and so I don't know. I'm not going to be cocky and say it's the residency that did it, but there's always there's always been something. But they, yeah, they rally around your. your there never was really, I guess, a central thing that right, that's that I'm was saying. regular that would always always yeah, happening. Did. So I don't know. Maybe we just. I think, I think it's, yeah, you did. You provided a, a venue for for the the rock scene to to surround it. And, and had a place to I guess play. Just you know? provided the, yeah. the meeting point. Yeah, I guess that's great. So and you're right. You and you yeah. and Jeremy have done this really cool jam. It's just and that's really cool. That you yeah. Done it. Okay, let's talk about unique experiences or stories. There's you know I love the stories because there's so many good ones in the rock and roll and stuff. Yeah. But uh, the latest story that for you is that you got to play with Gene and Ace Freely at the same time. Yeah. And I got to really you yeah. know, live this through your Facebook page a little bit. You got to play Ace's guitar and sound check. Mm-hmm. And he like, played mine the next day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. I remember the picture. Yeah, he, he, had, he didn't have his, but uh, that that was just ridiculous. That was I mean, like I said before, Ace is. Yeah, instrumental, no pun intended, in my lead guitar playing, and um, yeah, getting to hang out with him and getting to hear him not through a PA with a, with effects and echo on it, hearing him through yeah. that, yeah, standing this close to it, like right. coming out of that was <laughs> was was a, a unique experience. I mean, I can't I can't imagine what that's like to hear your hero that close. Yeah, just like I'm saying, I think I kneeled in front of him. <laughs> He was on stone. Right. He was so loud, but it just sounded like Ace. It was just right. like, that's all I could hear. Once he plugged in the plane, it was like he covered the drums. It was like this is awesome. So you go home that night. And what do you think? I mean, how do you how do you process that? <laughs> yeah, we just uh, <laughs> you go back to your room. I mean, yeah, we did. We uh, or all y'all. I mean, for Jeremy and and the other guys too. Yeah, we just, we just couldn't believe it. the whole day was crazy. We did, Ace d- didn't really get. We didn't really like meet Ace until he. Walked on stage, really even see him. Right. There was a big group meet and greet that we were in, but we didn't get to like actually hey. say hey or anything. Right. Um, but yeah, so when he comes up, it's like fucking ace, man. And he staggers over and hugs Gene and um, and we play Parasite first, and then yeah, it, it was great. It was that was unbelievable. That's crazy, man. I've never met Ace, and I've always wanted to meet Ace. But uh, I, yeah, he was. I mean, the, the second after that, we got to say hey, he signed some stuff, and he's like, "Oh, we should all get a picture of the Galva." So we had a picture with him, and no, he was super cool. So, how was the? What was the next gig that he did? Your guitar place. So the big, the big show Wednesday was a charity thing. Right, was um, a baseball. Which, field. There was at the St. Paul Saints. Okay. Field in St. Paul, Minnesota. Right. It was for the a charity called the Children Matter. So next. The next night was the, high, the the gala, like the private gala for the same charity. Okay, okay. Really high dollar thing. If anybody raised a million bucks that night wow. at the thing, wow. it was kind of an auction. They auction off. Um, Don Felder did house concert, so you could bid on a house concert from Don. Wow. You go to your place, play acoustic. Don's been involved as Gene has for and Sophie, and Gene's daughter, for a long time. Mm-hmm. And so, of course, Gene had a vault there, so they were they were auctioning off that kind of thing. So we yeah. backed up Felder again that night. So yeah, on the three tunes that we that? did. That yeah, it was great. Which ones did you do? We did uh, Take It Easy, Hotel California, and Pride and Joy. Wow. So we did that. So the 12 string, the double neck. Yeah. You got to play that. That's not the one. The they, this is Walker Hall of Fame, so I asked Don, I was like, is that the one? He goes, no, that's Walker Hall of Fame. But the cool thing about that guitar is it's got two output jacks. It's two separate guitars. Really? The 12 string has a Leslie simulator in the guitar. Wow. So that way for fly dates... He doesn't have to bring right because he only plays that song with that guitar. Right, so right, right. you're going to want to have that effect all the time. Right, it's built in. It's on board. Okay, cool. so he had two 
what Fender combos. So one was the six string, mm-hmm. and any six string that he played. Then only one of them was for the twelve. Okay, so he had that. So yeah, that, that, so yeah cool. the Leslie's always on. That was pretty cool. So how was he? He was cool. Yeah. Really cool. You seen the documentary on the Eagles? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is a great documentary. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> One of the best. I'm yeah. saying, I mean, I was just, wow, this is some really killer stories. I'm yeah, killer it, was, stories. It, was, it was good. Yeah. So, so fun. other unique. I played experience. bass on that game. Did you? For Felder. Yeah, I played okay. bass. Okay. I got to ask you about this other thing, too. The Wacken Festival when you worked with the Wolf. Yeah. Men. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I didn't even know what that was about. I knew you went, but I didn't know what it was for. I thought it was for Gene, but it was for Wolf Hoffman. With Wolf, yeah. So what was that about? It was some kind of symphonic thing. It was part of the Accept show. Okay. Uh, Wolf put out, I think, his second solo record, and they've both been uh, classical. Oh. Uh, it's called Headbanger Symphony. So what we what he did, he worked with an arranger, uh, Melo, great Italian guy. Right. It was, it's amazing. He was great. So they took classical pieces like Bald Mountain and Vivaldi and Beethoven and all these Mozart things um, and arrange them for a metal band right. and, put, and put riffs right. behind a lot of the famous lines right. and guitar solos in there right. but with strings so we went to Prague for a week and rehearse with the Czech National Symphony Orchestra. I think I saw those pictures just somewhere. Yesterday. Yeah, so we did that and then so we had like a 64 piece string and or you know orchestra with you know brass and, and strings behind us playing all these classical pieces. What was that like? It's fantastic. I mean, I it was that. awesome. I've never done that. That's before. like a dream to me. You know, I knew that was on my bucket list. I had no idea what was going to happen. One of the orchestra. But no, that was great when you're playing with you know that in, in a room with him and wow, just, with all just that power in there with him. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. That's kind of how do, how's it feel to sync with it? Is it sync pretty easy? Or? It was fun. I, I think my time in concert band, I kind of, really? I kind of. Went back to that. All that distance between you. Because yeah, because I kind of um, put myself like in the string section. Okay. I'm like I'm a, a viola player. Or I'm, or I'm a cellist or something. I'm like I'm 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 in the I'm in the band. Right. You right. know I'm not like you know I'm like part. Of, I thought of it as a solo. Of, right. I thought of myself as part of a section, and that kind of helped me. Um, you know, because when Peter went, because Accept played with the orchestra, also Peter Baltus, the bass player for Accept, we were rehearsing and. He was walking around with, like by the bases, and he was like, "You should go out there with the string section. It's like you're in the orchestra." And I was like, "Okay, we're all wireless." I walked out there and I was like, "You're right. This is this is a lot more fun. That's cool." Yeah. So that festival, and I talked to Damon about it last week, is is like eighty thousand people. Between eighty and ninety thousand. It is. It what was that like? Well, once you do when you're doing big outdoor shows above like forty. You can't really tell. Right. It's just like a lot of people. Right. You can't see the, the, the end of them. Yeah, right. When it's contained in a stadium or something like that, you can see, see the, the magnitude of it. But when it's just an open field like that, it's just like, wow. I, I can't stop seeing people. Right. On either on all, all sides. sides. Yeah. That's crazy. But no, it was great because um, I got to see Status Quo that day. <laughs> status Quo played the opposite stage, right, like, right, connected to us. Mm-hmm. So that was ridiculous. I got to meet. Francis Rossi, like the original guy left, and they were, wow. I, I'm a huge fan of them, and, and just getting to see them play, they are fantastic. So how do you go from, like, you know, the clubs, man, and, and you get the confidence to be on the stage like whacking? I mean, is it just because it's such a gradual thing for you? Yeah, I think, because I've been getting used to it as you go. Yeah, because even with, with, with uh, David Lee with, with, and Chris Cagle and Rodney and all the country stuff, you would do smaller club gigs, but then you do country thunder right. and play in front of 50,000 people. Right. So you do, you would do these big, huge festivals. Um, and with Morningwood too, like right. you know, we would do tiny club gigs and then play a thing in Japan for who knows how many people. So you yeah. just got used to the kind of, just, yeah, I mean, I mean, and still, you know, yeah. I'm going to the mercy lounge and so it's I mean, no different. Yeah, I know. Cause it's funny because you know, you or Damon have come off the road from one of these big festivals and I can't imagine what that's like. It should be like whiplash. It's, or just, not at all. it's not really any different. You just right. got, you know, you've got a bigger stage to, you got more ground to cover. Right. right. You just have to yeah. run. I guess you yeah. run more. Yeah. <laughs> I've got some big stages too. And yeah. You just have a lot more space. Yeah. Like, wow. This is kind of nice. You, you have know, to run around a lot more yeah, with the mercy and lounge. And you look like you're not doing anything. Yeah. That's such a big stage. You know, yeah. really over accentuated. Yeah. Things. Exactly. Right. Not saying Axl Rose laughs, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> yeah, you got to show some drama. That's crazy. So one of the things I want to ask you about too was the Leno uh, being on uh, was it Letterman that you were on the uh, Letterman and Leno. Sullivan stage yeah 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 that was great it's tiny in there really it's tiny in there uh, so the stage with, is small with Morningwood because you're on the floor 
We're wrong. Oh, oh, yeah, we're, we're on the front not four. No, not for us. There's a there's a drum riser, uh, and then there's a horn riser. So I'm I was stage right from Morningwood. So right here, we're the horn players. Right. I mean, you're right on them. The place is tiny. Right. Um, but no, that was great. Uh, Paul, the band was fantastic to us. They were so nice. We got to talk to Sid right. a long time. I was like, where's right. your yellow strap? You know, right. from, from, the, right. from the old days. Wow. You know, he was great. Uh, Paul was cool. I had Will and Anton sign my Ace Fraley solo record because yeah, they were on it. Because they were on that. Right. So they were like, I'm going to see Ace this weekend. <laughs> that's no, no that, was, that was a really cool experience. Letterman was the best one of those that we played for sure. I was going to say, you, you said. The crew. Because you knew, if you watched the show, you yeah. knew Biff and you knew the crew. And they right. were like, they were great. Isn't that, weird? Isn't that weird when you when you meet somebody like uh, when I met Eddie after all these years of of watching him on TV and yeah, you yeah. know but but you know you, you feel like you know them sure oh yeah yeah and yeah. And, it, and it somewhat is true you you do know their personality mm-hmm. you when you meet them you know, like you said Biff or you know those people you yeah know, you're so used to that's really who they are they're just being themselves yeah but most yeah, of the time yeah and then when you meet them it's like wow they're just like they were on TV. <laughs> Just yeah. say, it was strange, yeah. strange situation. So I've got uh, a few questions I want to ask you. Uh, these are my kind of you know final questions of this, and then we got one other thing I'm going to do with you. Uh, I want you to describe your feelings about music in one word. In one word. Gulp. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, oh man. I was going to say life, but that's so cliche and hippie, stupid. <laughs> I can say it. Music is a... Uh... Dude, it's a hard one. Yes. Uh, music is life, man. No, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to say music is career. Um, yeah. No, it's... Uh... Oh, Jesus. There's love. I love it. It's, yeah. you know, it's... Yeah. Language? Yeah, it's language. You know, yeah, you're right. Everybody can understand it. It is. It's a huge, you know, the language thing is, is massive. Connection? Yeah. So that's a good one? Yeah. How about several one words? <laughs> <laughs> you can pick from hey, those. I don't care. It's all good to me, man. That's cool. So uh, the other thing that is really a hot topic and often talked about by your boss is yeah. the state of the music business. Yeah. How do you feel about uh, currently the situation, uh, you know, with, you know, obviously there's the writing royalties that have been issues with Spotify. And sure. Everything. Yeah. But in general, how do you feel about the rock scene? How do you feel about the future of that? I, I agree with Gene mm-hmm. when he says rock is dead and I'll explain. Okay. I don't think he meant that people aren't, are, are going to stop playing rock music and kids aren't going to always pick up a guitar and always listen to music. That's not what he means. Um, what I think he meant was that rock as like a commercially viable thing mm-hmm. is dead. It's kind of true. Nobody's buying records anymore. I mean, especially rock records. Nobody's buying them anymore. So for I don't know what I would do if I was an original band. Yeah, I that's really tough. I really don't that's know. That's tough. It's really tough. Like you said earlier, back at one point, it was easier to get a gig doing that. Yeah. And now it seems like it's... It's, it's just really it's, it's really tough. And uh, so I think a lot of people kind of... And I, started, I mean, I started playing... I, went, I mean, I was playing covers with David Lee yeah, because yeah. I'm playing his songs, but it's not... It kind of. You know what I mean? I'm still playing covers. I didn't have anything to do with it. Right. But that's when I started making money. Right. Was when I started playing other people's music. Right. I got a check in the mail. It's like, right. wow, it's easier for me to get gigs than the four guys. But back to the, the, the rock is dead thing. The kids are always going to pick up guitars. Sure. Kids are always going to pick up drums. They're always going to be cranking out ACDC songs in their garage. Always. Yeah. Um, but I don't know about a resurgence because it's just so, it's just so different. Yeah. Than when we yeah. Well, you know, when we got into rock, one of the thing about you know talking about when we grew up versus now is, and it's it's weird even when we're picking out songs for you know the cover band type thing. Yeah, is we're trying to find a new say a new song. Okay, just say Mm -hmm. any artist. There's so much new music, but it's none of it's like when we got it. We got it very and a very defined. Uh, way that everybody heard the same song, you know. Yeah, we got uh, exposure that gave us all the same common experience. Yeah, how there's so many songs that even to pick a song for the band to play, it's it has to be a song that's like 
so dominating at yeah. this point. And, and that was true back then, but we got it through MTV and we all kind of got the same thing. And it, and it lasted. It lasted. And right. Now it's everybody's attention span is so is so short just because of the amount of information we get and the rate at which we get it. Right. Um, it's really hard. That, that people, it's just a song that is just huge is gone in a week. Like that Dodie song. Yeah, you know, yeah. Ever, yeah. I always remember I was in a bar and it came on the jukebox and everybody sang it in the bar. Right. It's like, is this, is this like as, as big as Don't Stop Believing? It's right. like, right. I guess not. It's gone next week. Right, right, sure. And there's so many songs. I mean, I've, I can't even think of another. I don't listen to. Yeah, I mean, you know, for us, what, when we play out live, the song like "Uptown Funk" was a really big song. Yes, it's still, it's still, it's still that's kind of still the, holding. Yeah, you know, as far as its popularity goes. But I yeah. think, hey, yeah, Outcast, like, hey, that's yeah. like one that's like, yeah, it's still sort of iconic. Seven Nation Army, yeah. yeah, that was a huge one. And there's and there are ones, but it, yeah. it's rare now. I think for some reason, yeah, I think so, they don't hold. They don't hold. It's just and it's not anybody's. It's not like somebody's fault. No. And, I, and I'm not. I'm not complaining no, about no. anything. It's just how it is. It's how it is, right? Just, you know, just not change. complaining. It's just change. Change. And you roll with it. You adapt. Right, yeah. You do you what know? you got to do. Yeah. So I, the advice to young musicians, we, we were kind of covered the sideman thing, but for you, you know, advice for any young and upcoming, if you had some kid here who was 13 and yeah. he, he was asking you what he should do, what would you say? Just keep keep working harder if if. You're going to be a musician. You're not going to have a choice of what you do. You're right. just going to do it. I right. mean, you can't. Like, anybody that like wants to be a musician shouldn't. Right. I forgot who said that. You know, like, that's a Duke Ellington quote. I'm totally ruining. But the bottom line was, if you want to be a musician, don't. <laughs> right. Because you're not going to have a choice. If that's right. what you're supposed to do, you're going to do it. You're going right. to find a way to do it. But if that's the case, if that's your lot, you know, if that's what you're what you're going to do. Um, you just keep working and be open minded. That's right. my thing because it's it's still my open mindedness and my hard work and my networking. Ten years ago is helping me out now. Right. Four months it's that whole so path. It's, that sure, whole, like this show's about. It's about the journey to get you to wherever you might go. You right. know, it's all those people you meet and you, you realize, like with, even with, when we were with Damon, how many of the connections he made from the very beginning. Yeah, were were instrumental in his. Oh ability yeah, to get to and I was. I could go. I mean, I don't have time, but I could dig. Yeah. I could dig yeah. into each gig yeah. and go. This one came from this tree. That the, it's just such a weird it's crisscross a family tree. Yeah, it is. It's such a layer and it's such an interesting. But it's so cool too. People that you meet years later yeah. are just tip you off on this other thing that ends up working out. Right, it's so, so it's, freaky. Yeah, it's a weird thing. I met. Ryan through Bo, and then now Gene, and just, so and we're best friends. Right. And it's just all of those things right. are connected. Because you know the gig, whatever gig you have, no matter how big it is, the gig is going to be over at one point. Sure, you're not going to play with this person forever. Right. They're going to want to stop. Right. And so when that happens, you have to make sure that you're taken care of. Right. And if you, it's easy with a really big and famous artist with it's doing successful. Mm -hmm. Have a lot of this um, has a hit single or something to right. Right, so you know, sit back and oh, this is great, ride right. the wave, not do anything, right? And then have the rug yanked off my yeah, when, when, when there isn't a hit single, right? Just, or when they stop doing something, so you've got to make sure that you're going to be okay, right? Well, cool. I've got this one thing I've done one time, yeah, where I get you to comment on five albums that I picked out of my album collection, okay? And I want you just to kind of go through these, cool. So one good. at a time. We'll start with. This one you can hold it up for nice. the camera. This is uh, Ozzy Osbourne, Wizard of Oz. This is fantastic. Uh, just a little thing about um, uh, Don Airy played keyboards on That's this. Right. Played yeah. Mr. Crowley from yeah. Deep Purple. And we played uh, Mr. Crowley and Who's That Solution with Don. Wow. Thank you. But no, this record, of course, is a huge in the high school. Randy Rhodes was a huge uh, thing for me, as was most kids. <laughs> By that, that age when you heard it, it was just, wow, yeah. Van Halen and Randy, you know. Um, I Love, I Don't Know. Yeah, right. Uh, Goodbye to Romance, one of the best songs ever written. This is fantastic. Right. But I also love Steal Away the Night, the way the riff, right. it's just cool the way the riff moves, the yeah. pattern of what he plays. Is, yeah, that's great. Some really interesting stuff on Any triple track solos. That right. Are, that's, right. That's phenomenal. What a great album. Yeah, that's a great album. And great songs too, like a good melodies. Always, you know, yeah. it wasn't it wasn't all screamy and metally. It was always tuneful, yeah. like pop. Yeah, I always love Rhodes. Rhodes is you know classical influence, the Michael Schenker feet, you know thing. Yeah, was, oh yeah. You know, I think first time I ever heard Michael Schenker was he did Captain Nemo. 
Yeah, I heard that. Yeah, this is prior to Van Halen, and even it was like I was hearing Zeppelin, you know, four and and Schinker. Yeah, and I was like, this is this first instrumental guitar stuff I'd ever heard before Satriani and Vi. Yeah, Schinker. He, you know, in the arena. Like, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I was yeah. like, what is this? Yeah. Stuff? And then so much of that style is in mm-hmm. Randy Rhodes's kind of thing yeah, just, as well. Fantastic, yeah, great, that yeah, great riffs, just good. Good tunes, which is going to like that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think all seven yeah. is Marshall. Use the, 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 the MXR Distortion Plus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There you go. All right, you ready? Yep. The one we talked about earlier. Yeah, this one. This was huge. Uh, yeah, once you got through the last song on side one, is I'm the one, and that killed me. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm the but one. I never saw. This is, this is the weirdest. <laughs> That's that's the picture they picked. All these <laughs> pictures are so weird. It's like the, like, that's the ones they work they picked for the band. Yeah, he looks like he's. <laughs> yeah, he's, like, he's, yeah, they must really, it's got to be post show or post workout or yeah, post something. <laughs> something. But no, it's great. It was, yeah. This is just so. I, of course, I didn't have the record, so I didn't have all the yeah the, this stuff with it. But. Right. But so, yeah, I had the CD. So how did you feel about yeah, Really Got Me? Did you like Really Got Me? Yeah, yeah, I loved it. Yeah. That, was, that was great. I just thought that that sound, that he, you know, the brown sound everybody talks about, that song, the way that riff comes off, and compared to the Kings version, it's it's tuned up higher. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's, you know. It's an A, or an A flat, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's a little different. Yeah. Yeah. It's, no, because you can hear the echo before you even know what an echoplex is. Right, you can right. hear it, and, and you can really hear the echoplex when you talk about love. Yeah, of course. It's going to, that, and the, that, and, 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 that thing. When you think about palm muting and, and that kind of technique, I mean, I, I know that, you know, probably Blackmore did it and people before Eddie. But for, for me, I just it seems like I just really picked up on the palm muting. Yeah. From me talking about love. Because it wasn't like Metallica palm muting. It, wasn't, it was different. Yeah, and with the, the single notes, and he's always sort of, you know, like with and, that whole riff. Yeah. And it was, it was, it was, you know, in between. Yeah, it was, it was a different, it wasn't like a, yeah, right. with a low end, it was, it was a more higher yeah. end. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it had the, the, the delay the on it, on it. Just made it. I just thought that was And cool. the verb, which made it sound just absolutely mm-hmm. enormous. Gigantic. And then, you know, then you've got a couple tunes that there was all this, almost like a, a couple odd metal tunes, like On Fire and Atomic Punk. Love them. Are on here and that's, that's just great. Or just ridiculous. On Fire is yeah. so progressive. I love it. It's just, then you have James Crime. Mm-hmm. Like a pop single. Yeah, I love it. It's amazing. All great songs. Yeah. Yeah, that's a killer album. Okay. So now we got to go back to the beginning, no. brother. You got this is for, Hell yeah. This, this is, is where I had. For your boss, this man. This is where I had A sign. <laughs> Did you have sign it? I had A sign. I had G sign right there, but that's where I had A sign. Yeah, man. This has all the songs on it. Yeah. I mean, this has uh, nothing to lose. Deuce, Strutter, Firehouse, Cold Gin. Oh, they're all. <laughs> they're everything. And I love uh, Love Theme. Oh yeah, I, I love to play love theme. That's cool. Um, yeah, uh, this uh, this album is is fantastic. Black Diamond. I love the studio ending of Black Diamond, where it just goes on way too long. Right. But I, it's, it's so awesome because it's so slow. Yeah. I love. Yeah. The sound sounds. It, the sound is um, so small, kind of compared to. Alive, it's better. I like it better than Heaven Hell. The production of Heaven Hell is yeah, so actually, weird. This actually, this is a reissue, and it yeah. sounds really good. I just like the, the, with the production and the mix yeah, is so strange. I, I, I like that. You heard even the Eddie Kramer demos and all this stuff. Yeah, too, right? yeah. yeah. That's, that was just killer. Yeah, yeah. Hundred thousand years is a weird tune. It's a weird song. I think it's so strange. Right. So the, 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 the logo, man. I mean, when I was a kid, I don't know about you, but something about the logo and the flashing logo. It's the best logo. The logo, ever. the flashing logo, when behind him on stage was just like that one was, one syllable name with a logo like that, and it just was yeah gen- genius. I mean, but that was just like I know it wasn't. I know there was a plan, but. You know, the, those four makeup designs are four of the most recognizable things on the planet. Sure. And it's, it's just... It's amazing. Came right out of his uh, his love for comics, right? Yeah. And all that. We should all, we should all wear makeup. We that's, just, all do. that's just amazing. It's, yeah. he, wanted, he said, he, I've seen this a bunch of times, he said he wanted to be the heavy metal Beatles. Heavy metal Beatles, yeah. yeah. Four guys that sang and... They definitely did that. Yeah. And I love the idea that they sang together. Yep. It sang solo. And that's why they shared microphones. It was like a Beatle. The two microphones. Right. And the Beatles, they shared harmony vocals on one. Right. You know. so, yeah. Fantastic. Probably my, my I don't know. Oh, this is the American one. 
That's got I've Just Seen a Face and... That's an original. Uh, what else is on? not on the British one? I'm Looking Through You isn't on there. I think it's it. Yeah. A couple different things on this one, but then the British one's the American one. But yeah, um, this one or Abbey Road are my favorites. It's kind of hard, um, hard to tell, but yeah, this was huge. And I had the American versions before the British versions. I didn't know the difference, and I was getting cassettes. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they actually... The American ones were easier to find, at least they were in North Fort Nebraska when I was right. <laughs> in 87. Right. So, um, you know, this is a great one. I love The Word, one of my favorite songs. Um, and uh, there's Think For Yourself is Cool to Fuzz. Mm -hmm. The guitar on that's so great. Yeah, I've always, I absolutely love. Weight was one of my favorite ones, too. Cool. Um, yeah, that was a, the, either that or Abbey Road. Just depends on what day you ask me about the favorite one. That's cool, man. All right, this yeah. is a good one. You ready? Okay. All right. This is my wild card. Okay. Boom. <laughs> you, have, you have vinyl. I do. And then you have this. I had it. I didn't listen to it a whole lot. Yeah. They still play. I liked uh, End of the Void was cool. Yeah. Um, that was a cool one. We were one was you wanted the best was awesome. That was a good one. Uh, we were one's jeans tune. But then it was a cool creepy tune. And um, it is not these four dudes playing on it. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it's no secret that right. it's a Aces on like Aces song. And, right, right. But um, you know, we were talking about how they sang. Yeah, you know their own songs, and they had their own. Each had a solo. So I remember when I was a kid and I saw them in '78 live that. I just thought it was cool that it, you know I always love Ace's songs you know not yeah. not being the technically great singer or Peter's song because he's got a cool yeah, he's but, got a but cool they voice. both had the you know the cool unique voice that made those songs so iconic. yeah yeah and, uh, and 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 they still did that I love it does Ace have another song besides In the Void on here I forgot I don't think so yeah No the Void yeah that was Ace but it was yeah. it was cool it was, you know spacey tune. Yeah, I just thought it was cool in 2000 when they came back on. Yeah, and I was super excited for for the record to come out. Yeah. Fair, Fairbairn did it. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, he did. That's right. But they were going to do Ezra. I think Ezra was doing something. Something. Else. Yeah. But yeah. Fairbairn's gone. Now. Yeah, I was super. Yeah, yeah, he is. I was super excited to uh, to to get that. This is how they were putting out a record again. So that was a really good time to be a Kiss fan. About ninety six, yeah, yeah ninety five, unplugged through the reunion. That was a right. being a Kiss fan was a lot of fun. It's like two thousand, man. I was there. I was in the show. I was like, yeah. I was like to see them back together in makeup because I'd seen them in seventy eight. Of course, I hadn't seen them since. So I'm on Revenge, yeah, my first one, and then um, Revenge was good. I saw them here. In, did you go to the BBC? BBC? That's where I was. I was there too. Yeah, did you go? No, I went to Birmingham show like in 2009. Okay, so you didn't go. It was uh, Matt Cooley. He was like on that show with the big uh, statue. He's actually yeah. with him off. Yeah. yeah. The Star Spangled Banner at the end? Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, man, that was killer. Yeah, then I saw the reunion I saw um, in Birmingham. Yeah, yeah. And I did Nashville. Okay. I think it wow. I think it went to awesome, man. on reunion. Yeah. Yeah, it was a good, good fun time for Kiss fans back then. It was killer. Yeah. Awesome. Well, man, I appreciate you having me on today. Man, thanks for having me, thanks man. Thanks for coming was, over and hanging out sure, and doing some rock and roll with me. That was just Phil stuff back here. Y'all check out him on Facebook, right? Yep. Tell, tell them where you're at. Uh, Phil Shouse on Facebook and uh, on Twitter and Instagram, V with two E's, Phil Shouse, and V Rock and Roll Residency, V with two E's as well. And Mutt Merch. And Mutt Merch, my t-shirt company. So if you have a dog or just really black dogs and rock and roll, get a Black Labbath, get a Bones and Noses shirt, get a Deaf Shepherd shirt, get a Grateful Dane shirt. Stop yeah. by MuttMerch.com. Uh, you can get shirts for your dogs and yourself. So <laughs> Thanks, man, for being here. Like I said, I'm, making, I'm getting ready for the Gene Gig is no more, so I'm... <laughs> Following his suit. That's right. <laughs> You're working for the man. Working for the best. Thanks, man. Absolutely, Jeff. Thank you.